Hello, everybody, and welcome to this special edition of the Digital Empathy Lounge brought to you by Anthrolytics. The Digital Empathy Lounge is a podcast exploring the best and next practices in customer experience management, and especially what great experiences should look and feel like. Now, today I'm in conversation with Neil Davey, who's the managing editor at MyCustomer.com, Ken Peterson, who's the president of customer experience at Question Pro, and my colleague, Jonathan Hawkins, who's the co-founder and CEO at Anthrolytics. Hi, all. Hey, Peter. Hi there. Great. So let's just do a quick round of introductions, if you wouldn't mind. So, Neil, um, if you wouldn't mind, could you just do a very brief introduction, please? Absolutely, Peter. So I'm um, Neil Davey, the managing editor of My Customer. Uh, for those unfamiliar with My Customer, it's uh, an online community of um, customer-centric professionals. So uh, it can be from the sort of marketing, customer service. There's this obviously the burgeoning kind of area of, uh, of of customer experience leadership as well. Uh, we've actually been going. Well, I've I've been uh, I've been working on My Customer for 15 years, but we actually go. You can kind of trace us all the way back actually to kind of the turn of the millennium when we were the, the crm forum so we have we're, we've, we've been writing about this since it was all fields in, in a sense um but uh, very much looking forward to today's discussion great thank you very much neil after 15 years you must be coming up for parole soon uh, <laughs> next i'd like to go to ken so ken if you wouldn't mind briefly introducing yourself please yes yeah, sure um as you mentioned president of customer experience for question pro I actually have a, a long career, uh, nearing a quarter century uh, with uh, marketing research and specifically uh, customer experience way back in, in the days when uh, we were still calling it CSAT and uh, trying to build out closed loop feedback and all those. Uh, have a background in operational management. So uh, that was my prior career into, before jumping into this. So uh, it really fed well into my background here. Great. Thank you very much, Ken. And um, last but by no means least, my colleague, Jonathan. Jonathan, would you mind introducing yourself, please? Absolutely not. So uh, Jonathan Hawkins is Peter Sands, CEO of Anthrolytics. I mean, Peter is very much the brains of Anthrolytics, it has to be said. So I, uh, I, I look after the uh, sort of commercial side of the business. Um, Again, I think like everyone on the call, long, long history in the customer experience space, both from a contact center perspective and then latterly in the measurement uh, running the commercial operations for Satmetrics, who are co-creators of MPS. And uh, obviously now uh, Anthrolytics trying to, uh, you know, forge a new path into, into the new world of CX. Great. Thank you very much, everybody. Now, today we're going to talk about um, a recently released white paper from Anthelytics about why empathy is the big competitive differentiator, not just competence. Now, you'll find a link to the white paper in the comments below. But first, Ken, let me come to you. Um, this is a, a discussion that I hear a lot of businesses are getting involved in about you know, what is empathy. So why do you think there is such so much discussion about empathy in business right now. Well, I mean, we've been saying a long time in customer experience, I mean, companies need to do something to recognize that they're different. I mean, especially online where, you know, every website, you know, has a, a style sheet behind it, but they're all the same. I mean, they're the same, selling the same products. Uh, you can get them one product from hundreds of different online retailers. Um, you know, so, Really, the challenge becomes how do you do that at scale? I mean, you can train people uh, like we're having in an emotional to have that emotional intelligence in a one on one conversation. You know, we can talk back and forth. I can read your eyes and see, you know, are you looking away? Uh, but, you know, how do you do it when you, you're, you're not in a one on one conversation when it's a machine talking? And, you know, I mean, you can try something like empathy mapping, you know, sort of like the segmentation, but every individual is different. I mean, you can't assign someone to a large segment and say, oh, well, this is this is a personalized experience for you and 100 out of the 100,000 other people that just have that same template, just like you. <laughs> so um, it, it is really about, um, you know, how do you build that out um, at that mass level uh, and still make it personalized? And it's, it's, it's a real challenge. Yeah, thank you, Ken. It is indeed. And I think if there's one thing that um, a lot of us have seen is that we do want to be treated like individuals now. We expect more than basic competence. Now, Neil, let me come to you, because you and I have done uh, quite a bit together when we've been researching the role and the importance of empathy and things like um, customer service and the customer experience. 
Do you agree with the findings, though, that we keep seeing that customers really seem to prefer empathy over price or outcome? Yeah, absolutely. So, so we did a piece of the piece of research that you kind of alluded to. That we did this piece of research uh, as a survey of uh, 500 consumers that we conducted back in 2020 to gauge how well customers think organizations are responding to the need for empathy in, in customer service interaction as well as looking at kind of kind of uh, the, the implications for those that do or don't deliver empathy well so in terms of your question of whether customers sort of prefer you know is it empathy versus outcome in a sense that that, that was something that we kind of drilled down to uh, in in these kind of 504 respondents and we had um we deliberately kind of chose these respondents based on the fact that these were were folks that told us that they had felt one or more set of emotions but anger worry frustration that kind of thing um, during a specific recent customer service interaction and with that particular interaction in mind the respondents then told us about their behavior emotions and opinions during and after that specific engagement now for the purposes of the research we kind of defined empathy as the ability to understand another person's emotions uh, and, and imagine what that person may be thinking or feeling or why so so to define whether customers kind of prefer empathy over outcome, what we did, we, we, we kind of compared four different scenarios. So we had one where the, the query was, was resolved and the respondents told us that their emotions were very well understood and acknowledged by the customer service agent. We had one where the query was, was not resolved, but the respondents told us that their emotions were still very well understood and acknowledged. Uh, we had one where the query was resolved, but the, the respondents told us that their emotions were not understood or acknowledged at all. And then we had a final one where the query was not resolved and the respondents told us that their emotions were not understood or acknowledged at all. Um, so digging through all of that, what we found was that those who did not have their query resolved, but they had an interaction which, uh, with, with, with an agent that understood or acknowledged their emotions very well, they were actually much more likely to be satisfied with the overall experience than those that had their query resolved, but had an experience where they felt that their emotions were not understood or acknowledged at all. Um, so only 16% were either very satisfied or satisfied with the experience if they had their issue resolved, but felt that there was no empathy. And there were also 38% that were actually actively very, very dissatisfied in that scenario. Meanwhile, for those that hadn't had their issue resolved, but they felt their emotions were understood and that there was empathy in that interaction, 60% were either very satisfied or satisfied. So the conclusion here appears to be that while query resolution is, of course, of sort of, of primary importance to, the, to respondents, a lack of understanding and acknowledgement of these of their emotions, it can really undermine the experience. And, and while a very good understanding and acknowledgement of emotions it can, it can also take a, a sting out of the query if it isn't resolved as well. So um, now, obviously, we conducted the, the kind of research. This was the, the very early days of the pandemic. I think it was like May, I think April or May, I think when we conducted it, and obviously, and, and that was May 20, April, May 2020, so very early days of the pandemic. Not that we knew that back then, if, if only we'd known that was still the early days, we would have been terrified. Um, but I, mean, so I would say that since then, you know, empathy's obviously become even, even greater importance. Um, uh, so something that brands have acknowledged in their marketing, at the very least, we see a lot of empathy in in, uh, in marketing campaigns now. But I would say if you're one of the brands that's going strong on empathy and compassion in your marketing and your service interactions, and you're not backing that up, uh, then you know, you're probably going to do even greater damage to customer relationships because you're talking the talk, um, but not walking the walk. So that's kind of the conclusion overall, is that yes, brands sort of need to do a great job with their customer interactions in terms of efficiency and effectiveness and problem resolution, of course. But that kind of customer experience is really is that's the minimum expectation. And, and, and even that might not be enough in some circumstances if there isn't an emotional understanding, there is an empathy uh, there uh, in accompanying that as well. Okay. Thanks very much, Neil. And that empathy gap is something that I found was very striking as well. Um, clearly what's going on is that people, as you said, expect brands to do a good job now. That's what they pay us for. But they're now expecting a lot more. So, Jonathan, let me come to you, because you and I are having lots of conversations with brands at the moment who yeah, are really interested in the whole idea of empathy. So why is it that empathy is such a hot topic for CX professionals and brands right now? Why is it such a hot topic and why yeah, now? I know, 
Yeah, I, mean, I, think, I think why now? I think I think both Neil and Ken have alluded to this. Like there, there is a, there is a significant timing issue. You, you look at what's happened in the world over even pre-pandemic, but a lot of the sort of socio-political events that have gone on, um, yeah, a lot of expectation around personalization. You know, people now demand more. I think as as both Neil and Ken said, look, pretty much every major organization, whether it's telco, FS, what you know, whatever it is will all execute operationally to a certain level, right? Um, I can go to any telco and my phone's going to work, I'll get signal, blah, blah, blah. So, so the question then becomes, right, to Neil's point, am I treated empathetically? Um, do they understand me? Do they, do they try and sell to me when I'm angry? Do they, um, you know, all these things that just we find annoying. And I think because we had a lot of time on our hands during the pandemic, those things became more annoying, right? We saw lots of platitudes from brands about, you know, sort of how wonderful they were in terms of treating, you know, many brands are still using it as, as an excuse. Well, we've got long queues because of the pandemic, well, really after two years. Um, so I, I think that people's expectations of brands, both on a, an individual level and also how they treat employees, the wider community is, but it's just raised up in terms of people's priority levels. It certainly has in mind. And I think as, um, you know, if I look at my daughter's generation, you know, generationally, this is only become, going to become a bigger and bigger challenge for brands because, you know, the kids don't have the same level of loyalty to a bank that my parents did or I would do, right? They can go to a fintech, they can start up an account in a matter of seconds. If it doesn't meet their needs or they don't feel understood, well, they just bin it and go to somebody else, right? So, you know, there is a, I think there is a, um, there are a lot of mechanisms whereby people can change more easily. The expectations are higher. And, and I think, um, and our audience probably isn't going to like me for saying this, but our industry just hasn't kept up with it, right? They, they, they base the empathetic or they talk about empathy in terms of, I'm going to survey a bunch of people once a year. I'm going to know that somebody's upset when I send them a very heavy bill that they weren't expecting. Well, you know, and they're going to be angry with us. So let's not do that. I mean, it's hardly rocket science, right? You don't need any technology to tell you tell you that. So I, th I think the challenge now becomes for certainly for the CX industry. How do we start becoming proactive? How do we start using data that we already have within the business? to drive proactivity and, and make that proactive operational change based around empathy, i.e. I know that Ken's angry, so why, why, why am I going to sell to Ken today, right? I know that Neil's very happy. Well, why would I put Neil to a very expensive agent in a contact center if I think he's happy and he's not going to buy anything? <clears throat> I may as well push Neil through self-service and he'll be just as happy at the end of it. Right. So so I think, you know, we need to get smarter. The CX industry as a whole needs to get smarter. Um, and that's not to say that surveys are a bad thing because they're not. They're absolutely required. But there are, there are times when it's just simply not sufficient. And I think empathy is one of those areas. Um, and, and obviously, Peter, as you know, look, that's why we, we built analytics, right, to meet that need and try and help the brands meet the needs of the consumers, you know, by allowing them to understand the emotional state of every customer every day, by allowing them to understand how do we segment by empographic or emotional profiles to understand that, well, Peter's heading towards a threshold where he might churn. Well, how do we head that off at the past? Uh, the past, we know he's going to churn. We know why he's going to churn. Well, let's do something about it. <clears throat> and I think that is the next evolution of the CX industry, where it starts becoming far more proactive. Um, is far easier to generate an ROI because you're linking, you know, emotions to behaviors to financial outcomes for the business, and frankly, provides way better returns for the business. And is also way better for the consumer who is obviously demanding to be, you know, treated empathetically. So very long winded answer. But I think, uh, yeah, our, yeah the, I, I would urge people to think about how they can become proactive. Yeah, thank you very much, Jonathan. And that's such a good point. And, you know, in one of these podcasts I did a, a week or so ago, it came up that um, that a professional saying so many of their clients are saying, well, we know you gather data for us. We expect that you should know us better than we know ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. And so it is that proactivity and that anticipation, I think, that is so important. And it is partly based upon not just what people are doing, but what they're feeling. 
Neil, let me come back to you. Now, I'm an avid reader of my customer and, um, you know, I contribute occasionally as well. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, it's a great resource for customer focused professionals. And it does cover a wide range of topics like efficiency, the best technologies, process change. Now, I know that you and my customer have been thinking about empathy a lot. So where does it fit within your view of that customer focused um, canon of, in, of knowledge that we're developing over time? Well, well, first of all, Peter, thanks for your very kind words about my customer. <laughs> Much appreciated. Um, Just so, leave the money in the usual place. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> in, yeah. <laughs> Unmarked bills. Um, okay. So for, for one, one thing I would say, I mean, the, 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 clearly there is, as, as Anthrolytics has demonstrated, there is now a kind of a technology component to, to empathy that you could have. But actually, I mean, a lot of what we, when we talk about empathy, um, and this is one of the big challenges for organizers is that there is a, a really, you know, a lot of it is all right, culture and the philosophy is a business. And unfortunately, culture is actually, it's a, it's, a, it's, a big, it's a big issue. It's a real tough, it's a tough cookie. Um, and certainly to change culture quickly. I mean, uh, this is an example, and, and I'll give you a, this is, a, this is an, an exclusive because we haven't actually released a piece of research yet. But we, my customer recently, we conducted a survey of, of customer experience leaders and we asked them, uh, as part of, of a, a kind of a, a number of different different questions, but we asked them. Um, one of them was, "What would you consider to be the biggest obstacle to the success of the CX program?" Um, and company culture or culture change was actually reported by forty four percent of our respondents, which made it the second biggest, uh, most commonly reported obstacle in our report behind. Um, I think it was the company silos. And in fact, it's actually becoming more of an issue because 36 reported it as a challenge when we conducted the same survey two years ago. So it's going from 36 up to, to 44 in the space of two years. Um, whether or not that's kind of the result of greater remote or hybrid working, I don't know. But clearly, you know, that, that, that's sort of beyond the remit of this particular piece of research. But cultural challenges are on the rise and, and in terms of how culture impacts um, the customer experience program. But culture is crucial. You know, you may, you may recall... Uh, a few years ago, United Airlines passenger. Can you remember there was the, there was the, the, oh, the, the video? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he knocked unconscious, forcibly dragged off the, the flight. It was somebody recorded it, went viral, did tremendous kind of reputational damage to to to, to UA. Um, it was then kind of compounded by the, the tr some incredibly tone deaf public apologies from the uh, from the the CEO whose statements kind of lacked any empathy whatsoever. I think they first of all he was he was just apologizing for having to reaccommodate customers. Then he blamed the victim himself for being belligerent. And it wasn't until the kind of the, the third statement that he kind of accepted responsibility and pledged to actually do any better. But, but it turns out this was just kind of one end of several incidents that occurred with United Airlines. I mean, within the space of a few weeks, there'd been some absolute horror stories about dogs being stowed in overhead compartments and some, some really awful stories that, that pointed to Kind of a lack of empathy that stemmed from just an, a really terrible company culture and eventually the ceo actually kind of admitted that the company's culture had become really toxic because it forced employees to prioritize efficiency over the care for customers and he said that you know this is a problem because we've let our rules and our procedures get in the way of our people so even though it can be a vast undertaking empathy comes it comes down to a lot of it comes with your culture and your philosophy as a business um one thing i would add though is that there, there are kind of other nuances to, to all of this when it comes to how we, we cover um, empathy on, on my customer, because the reality is that not every customer interaction requires the full human empathetic experience. If a customer wants to do something simple and routine, um, and, and, and this is exactly um, you know, what's being alluded to a little bit earlier on by Jonathan, you know, paying a bill, something straightforward, they might not really care about compassion because they will probably just self-serve save themselves time i don't want or need to speak to another human being meanwhile if i'm doing something a bit more complex or something that has an emotional element to it i might want more than that i might want someone to talk to or listen to someone to understand how i'm feeling and to really focus on on helping me so there's a lot of work going on to not only ensuring that you're sort of catering for both of those needs but also ensuring that if you're self-serving and then something goes wrong you find out there's unusual activity in your account or this uh, can't make a payment or something and all of a sudden a routine interaction can suddenly become emotive um, and that's when you sort of need to be able to ensure that you can triage the customer to a human agent very quickly and easily to be able to help them out because that interaction has suddenly escalated and they're, they're, they're now worried concerned anxious and that's when they, they do need empathy so there is this 
also this kind of focus there's a cultural piece but then there's there's this sort of process and, and technology component as well about, about how to make sure that um what kind of experience your customers want and if they and, and if you know changing circumstances how you can kind of triage them from from one particular channel to another one so um it's in other words it's kind of empathy is very much sat in many of the the kind of real uh, important pops of customer experience that we, we cover on uh, on my customer Great. Thank you very much, Neil. And there's a couple of things I'm hearing there that I'm, I'd like to just sort of uh, focus on just for a moment. The first of which is, as you quite rightly point out, um, yeah, we're not all the same. And sometimes contextually, you know, we might prefer to self-serve and other times we may want to involve a human being. And I think that if we looked at a classical segmentation approach to dealing with that, we might say, well, Peter's one of these tech savvy, self-sufficient people who like self-serving, we'll enable that and you know, let Peter have at it. But I think what often confuses that is, of course, I might change halfway through, as you say. <laughs> so I was perfectly happy with self-serving, but then I've come across something else. And now I want to break that habit and do something a little bit different, like talk to a human being. And I think we've all recognised that. But one of the dangers I think that many businesses have faced when they talk about empathy is something else that you alluded to as well, is that we think that this is something that's a big cultural issue, or if we just give people enough um, EQ training, and if we design the processes well enough, um, then we can build it in. But in none of those cases did I say, and if we listened to our customers. So Ken, I want to come to you because Question Pro I know is right at the heart of you know, getting those understanding about what's important to people, you know, why they mention things. And if I looked at the use of things like survey tools in customer experience, we've had decades of doing voice of the customer and satisfaction surveys. But I think what I'd like to ask you though is, other ways we could be getting more out of these kinds of technologies that perhaps we aren't doing so well with at the moment. Well, yeah, and I, I think a lot of that uh, first, I mean, it's not to ask a bunch more and more quantitative questions. Oh, I need this KPI measured. I need that KPI measured uh, to better understand the customer. I need to know if they saw this holiday promotion, you know, uh, there's this overwhelming urge to say, well, we need to learn about empathy. So, Let's just ask them if they felt we were treated empathetically. And um, I, I think even if we asked the four of us in the room to find empathy and we all went to our corner and wrote down, we'd probably come back with a little something different yeah. because empathy to each one of us is a little different even because, you know, even even the example that you provided, you know, if you're tech savvy and you're, you know, 99% of the time want to do it on your own, you're more efficient that way. What about that 1%? <laughs> like, you know. We've got to be able to, I, you know, work with both of that. And, you know, I, I remember a story very early on in my career uh, when I was young and brash versus now when I'm just old and brash. Um, I, I, you know, um, my supervisor had said to me, hey, I, I need you to write that question in a way that, you know, really brings out that connection um, between this brand and you know, family, like really makes it. And I, I wrote something very flowery. Um, I wrote a couple of very direct questions and I wrote some very flowery and it was something along the lines of, you know, like white puffy clouds in the sky, like green grass, just fresh cut and smelling great. And, you know, a couple of descriptors. And then I said, brand, this means family. And he looks at the three questions that I offered. He goes, I really like that third one, but can we make it a little shorter? <laughs> so it was like, okay, you, you wanted to get, you know, sort of that feeling part out of the, the customer. And then the first thing he said is, okay, let's cut down the question so we can add more questions. And I think, you know, giving them listening posts is important. Um, so, you know, I always say, give them more opportunities to give feedback. Don't push them into the opportunities, but give them more opportunities. Always have that something there. I mean, you know, along the lines of, you know, when you, when you call in, how hard is it to get a human? I mean, nowadays when you call into any place. And um, so the, the worst thing that you can ask on a survey is, you know, do you feel like they were empathetic? And, you know, how do you feel it? You know, it's really, you can't really action on that and you really can't get the feeling of what the customer was trying to achieve. So, I mean, you really want to target the questions in a narrative way let them give them an opportunity to tell the story. You know, um, how would you describe your experience to a stranger? 
uh, something like that really brings out a little more conversational flow. And I think the, uh, you know, little things like uh, being able to add a, a video response, uh, huge. I mean, don't, don't add another set of, you know, KPI measurements. Add a, add a short video and and look at the expressions. Actually, watch them. I think that's probably the other downside of you know the the qualitative data that's pulled in so much. So few people actually read it. They 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 want to say, okay, well, let's analyze it and then put it through our KPI tool and say, okay, well, this fits with this KPI and that fits with that KPI, which then ties to our number in, internally. And it all goes back to how do we view it internally, uh, and does it does it make sense to our narrative instead? let them give their narrative, let them talk as if they are them, let them talk to you as if they're talking to a friend so that they, you know, you really evoke that right response and you don't do it by piling on a bunch of questions. You make it very conversational. Uh, I'm not saying you can't get a rating, a rating is important, um, but if you live and die by those ratings, uh, you're really losing the purpose of that survey to begin with. So, um, you know, it's, it's really about you know, getting that that thinking mindset behind it. Great, thanks very much, Ken. And I think, um, yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, not being a great human being that understands other human beings really well. I know that the worst thing I can do to find out how somebody feels is to ask them how they feel. Not only do they not know how they're supposed to answer that, but I'm not even sure I know how to interpret it. So I think that though it is important that these are great instruments for beginning to identify what people care about. And that question, that open question, that storytelling question is superb for doing that, it, for getting people to talk about what they care about, and then they'll express why they care about it. But Jonathan, let me come to you then. Um, and it all sounds great in theory, doesn't it? We're gonna be empathetic organizations. We're going to show compassion to our customers and our employees and suppliers. But how do we take it from that nice sounding theory into practice? So what are some of the practical steps that organizations can take to put this compassionate business into practice? Yeah, I, I think the first thing, I mean, as always with any form of program, it, it starts with getting buy-in at the corporate level that you want to do something perhaps a little bit different. And so I, I think always, um, you know, understand what the what the outcome is, right? How, how is this going to benefit you and the customer? I know we touched on this earlier, but... Um, I think it's important when you start building out these programs is to have a very, very clear idea about what is the problem you're trying to solve. And, and Peter, we, we've seen this when we've, we've run programs for, for companies. And I think the, the most successful programs that we've run are programs where somebody has, has said, I have a defined problem, right? I'm trying to improve growth in upsell. I'm trying to reduce churn, you know, there's, or reduce employee resignations, employee churn, and there's a very defined outcome that you're targeting. So I think when you start thinking about operationalization, particularly with something that's new like this, it's pick your battles, pick your area of the business, right? And pick a very clearly defined outcome so that you can actually prove the worth of whatever it is you're thinking of doing. And certainly we, we see that that is the most successful way of um, get, getting these things in place. I mean, as you know, we, we ran a, you know, a, a great case study with a telco recently where it was just a very, very simple challenge we were trying to solve, right? How can you sell more to our customers every month, right? That was, that was it, right? We, we want to compare using the Anthrolytics platform to the way we do it already. And so we picked a very, very defined area. We ran a series of A-B tests and we, you know, thankfully, as you well know, produced 90% more revenue than the traditional way of doing it, which was obviously a fantastic outcome. But I think we could have equally done that very, very poorly by not having that defined outcome. So I think, I think first things first, pick what you're going to go after and then really understand, right, what are we going to do with this information? Because ultimately, whether it be Question Pro's platform, whether it be Anthrolytics platform or any other platform that you have, if you're just getting a lot of data and you're not doing anything with it, then guess what? You're not going to move on. I think as you know, Ken was saying, you know, we can we can meet our KPIs for what that's worth because they're internal, but we're not going to change anything for the customer. So I think secondarily, right, how are we going to operationalize this? And 
certainly in terms of you know the anthrolytics platform it's very much a case of right how are we going to apply once we understand the emotional profile of every customer every day we understand what their next likely behavior is going to be um what are we now going to do with that right are we going to drive it through our martech platforms to and increase value to those? Are we going to drive it through a sales channel? Are we going to give that information to contact center team leaders, as an example, who have remote teams and, and we're trying to reduce employee attrition? So I, th I think pick your outcome that you're most interested in, your biggest challenge. I think secondarily, understand how you're going to operationalize that data. Um, and I, I'm certainly a great advocate of not piling more tech platforms on top of more tech platforms. I think, you know, adding into the existing ecosystem that is there. And that's certainly, you know, our philosophy as an organization that we try and integrate with the existing ecosystem to drive, drive more value. Um, and, and then measure. Right. So so when certainly when you're starting to try and predict employees or customers emotions and outcomes, I think it's also very important to keep revisiting and say, OK, well, we made this change. How did that subsequently now change the emotions of our employees or customers? Right. So it becomes another feature in the AI modules that that starts learning again and again. So I think don't bite off more than you can chew. I mean, I, I had a conversation with somebody this morning who said, we have a very big organization. He said, great, well, why don't, why don't we run it across the whole company and we'll figure out where it's best? And, you know, I shuddered at that thought because I know what's going <laughs> to And Ken, you know what's going to happen as well, don't you? Right? Nothing is going to happen, right? And it's, we're going to have it on our Nothing face. Nothing at all. Right? <laughs> Nobody's ever going to look at the data. Nobody's going to do anything. So in terms of operationalizing, pick your business challenge. That has a, a defined ROI, pick the area that you're going to try it and start expanding out from there. That's very, that will very much be my recommendation. And I think particularly when you are talking about something that's new and, you know, we, we, I think live in our, our little bubbles. We've been, we've all been talking about empathy and emotion for some time. I think that's now starting to get to a far broader sort of consciousness, if you like, but I think it's also very easy for the four of us on this call to forget that, We've been might have been talking about this for three years, but this is a brand new concept to many people, um, and, and and a lot of companies are trying to catch up with the way consumers. And I think, you know, I think Ken mentioned about the definition of empathy, but um, you know, if you asked a consumer how they wanted to be treated, they wouldn't stick their hand up and say empathetically. I mean, so last thing a consumer would say there, but you know, so so I think you couldn't ask a consumer how they want to be treated. Um, but we we know it's empathy, we know it's emotion, and so but because it's new, we've got to start somewhere controlled and build out from there. So very long winded way of saying, pick your battles, show the ROI, right, and then branch out from there. Great. Thanks, Jonathan. And I think the thing about pick the battles when you are dealing with something new is so important because I think if you talk to many business leaders, particularly perhaps some of those who've gone through the same kind of um, 80s management training I went through, this all feels a little bit pink and fluffy and not very yeah. hard and focused when, in fact, the results clearly are. As well, you said, as, as you well know, Peter, that was my hesitation when we were talking about <laughs> setting up the business. I, I said, I'm only doing it if I know it can, if I can prove it, that it has results because, you know, pink and fluffy is lovely, but it doesn't pay the bills. <laughs> so <laughs> Absolutely. Well, in our case, maybe it will. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, that, that, but really all that, that remains for me to do is to um, thank you, Jonathan, Neil and Ken. Uh, Neil, uh, mycustomer.com is still my go-to repository for all things about customer thought and Ken love the tools you know the question pro because they're absolutely at the heart of you know our first step which is to try and understand what do people care about so that we can operationalize that by what treat them in the way that they want to be treated um, using the tools at our disposal. So that brings us to the end of this special episode of the Digital Empathy Lounge, and I hope you've enjoyed it. You'll find a link to the white paper in the comments below. Um, please do download it. There's a lot of work gone into that. There's some very practical lessons, as well as a little bit of the discussion about the theory behind it. And I'd like to just leave you with an invitation. So if you would like to be a guest on the Digital Empathy Lounge, then let me know. And again, you'll find the details on how to do that in the comments. But until the next time, um, I want to thank you all. Um, Jonathan, Neil, Ken, thanks very much. Thank you. Um,
Take care, everybody, and see you again soon. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.